my friends we are back at it let's look at some more french gothic architecture and if and if i play my cards correctly we'll do some things in germany england and italy as well um here we go i give you a cathedral in amiens in france and again uh if all distance are measured from paris amiens not terribly far away and if i can find my map i'll bring it back here you go so we looked at paris we looked at chart we looked at saint denis and amiens is just due north maybe an hour or so easy to get to on the train by all accounts um and this building was begun in 1220 that's when the corner state was corner stone was laid the la the nave was finished in 1236 and it was consecrated as a church in 1241 which meant it was then kind of open for business in 1247 the chapels on the back end uh, of the church were completed and in 1270 they finally finished the choir once that happens the church is essentially open for pilgrim business because now the relics are in there and and the buildings are ready to have pilgrims come and visit the north tower which is this one here dates from the 15th century and this one here is from the 14th century and again think about this in regards to structures over a hundred years clearly this was cool and now that's cool even though I think it's cool to have things match. Now, interestingly, we know the architects for this building, and that is relatively rare in the history of Western art prior to the Renaissance. Um, in my traditional survey classes, I have a running joke with those students that when I took survey one, which explored Gothic architecture, my professor, Dr. Williams, never made me learn the name of the architects, so I never make students learn the names either. Um, but we actually know their names. History has forgotten most architects' names, sadly, prior to the Renaissance. They were simple craftsmen or, or builders and not really intellects like we think of them today. I've never been to Amiens, although when I go to, um, when I take students abroad to Paris and Amsterdam in 2021, we're going to have to make a run out there. It has a lot of the architectural elements present in Paris. So we have gargoyles and grotesques to get water out of the way of the foundation of the church. We have our traditional tripartite uh, uh, entranceway into the church. But I wanted to show you a diagram of the interior. And one of the really important ideas is that these churches are kind of all competing for your tourism dollar. Like if you're a pilgrim, you're going to make one pilgrimage to this year, maybe two, but certainly not three. And so where are you going to go? Well, you're going to go to the place that's cool, that you think is the coolest. And one of the ways in which builders are try to reinforce that coolness was by creating a greater sense of verticality. And so the cathedral at Amiens has a height of 144 feet. That's about the same height as the Pantheon in Rome. And that thing was built a thousand years beforehand. But the other thing that happens is that the nave becomes increasingly more narrow. And that makes the building seem as if it's higher. And I've, and I've done this before with you, but I'll do it again. Like, doesn't that seem to be higher? But the height is the same. So by, by increasing the verticality, there's a, a perceived sense of greater height. Amiens is taller than Chartres or Notre Dame, and Reims is, uh, is second highest. And so we will see some really interesting ways in which verticality is going to be reintroduced in some of these churches. There's the nave. It's lovely. And here's the cathedral at Reims. And I want to talk a little bit about the sculpture here, because it is at Reims where we can really get an idea for the rapidly <coughs> shifting sculptural developments in Gothic, French Gothic architecture. This church, uh, the majority of which was constructed between 1225 and 1290, has two towers that look very much the same. And I, the way I always remember this as a student is Reims is remarkably similar. Remarkably similar. They both start with R. Is it stupid? Yep. 
Did I ever mix up Amion in rhymes? Nope. And so the towers here are very similar to, compared to many other churches. I wanted to show you this scene. It's a scene that we will come back to us again and again um, because of the, its importance in the Renaissance art. And we've already looked at a couple um, uh, annunciation scenes. And this is a scene from Mary's life just before that. So as a good Catholic boy who used to pray the, ro pray the rosary, there are um, the rosary is comprised of a number of decades, and, and uh, which is a series of prayers. And at the end of each decade, you think about one of the mysteries, and there is a series of joyful mysteries, which involve the, uh, the conception and pregnancy and birth of Jesus. And one of those is what's called the visitation. And this is when Mary is visited by her mom, St. Anne Elizabeth, um, here. And I call your attention to something really interesting here. Look at the contraposto. Weight shift, holy smokes, bent knee, bent knee, weight shift. And think about how different that is than these breadsticks. Let me find the breadsticks that we looked at earlier. No weight shift, right? Those are, that is not a sense of weight shift there. And now we have this, this looking back to the classical past as a way to render the human body. And right next to it, right next to it, we have an Annunciation scene, right? These, this dates from around 1230, these from around 1255. So right next to one another on this church, we have a pair of statues that both involve the life of Mary. And think about how different they look. Think about how classical, how Greek these almost look. And these are back to being breadsticks. And so I shouldn't say back to being, they're earlier. So the reason for this, again, they're made 25 years apart and a lot can change in 25 years, but they're also made by two different artists. Artists, I suggest that's true, or I suspect that's true. It's not, it's not universally true. As a way of talking about that point, when you go to DC and you should, and you go to the National Cathedral and you must, all of the sculpture there has been done by one single Italian man, primarily on the front of the church, at least. Um, it has been his life work. And in 2006, just as I was getting ready to leave uh, the D.C. area, I took my summer class there to meet with him. Um, and he had been working there for 60 years. Right? He was 81 years old and still working on the church, which is really, really fantastic. And so, so it doesn't have to be this different artists, but I suggest that it is. So just as a way of giving you some, some nice exterior uh, pictures, again, uh, postcard fixture never happens, at least seldom in my life. Here's the, the royal portal, and you can see Jesus crowning Mary again. Rhymes Cathedral, just like Amiens Cathedral, is really a Notre Dame Cathedral. Um, but as so as not to confuse the world at large, the only Notre Dame is in Paris. Hooray. Let's shift gears, my friend. Use that left foot, find the clutch, because we are going to cross the channel and go to Great Britain. And although, to be honest, Great Britain doesn't exist in the 13th century, it is England. And so let us look at some English Gothic, because we'll think about the ways in which these churches are going to look different, and they're going to look different because they have different, slightly different functions. And so as a way to get there, I want to call your attention to the front of the church. And by the way, I love John Constable. He's a, a British landscape painter from the, the, the early part of the 19th century. So this is his, his portrait of Salisbury Cathedral. Uh, and this is a picture of it. So let's think about the ways in which this church looks different right from the start. And one of those differences involves the ways in which the big towers that we see in French churches are replaced with these little bitty ears here. And rather than having a kind of vertical front, we have a horizontal front, right? So that's one of the major differences. And then many English Gothic churches have a centralized spire. English churches are often also surrounded by a variety of other architectural structures, 
um, that speak to the function of these churches as being parts of monasteries. And so this is a diagram of the plan of Salisbury Cathedral, including dates upon which they worked the church. And I call your attention to this. The cloister was an original part of this church, was a place for the monks to ambulate around. And if we look around this, you can see that there's a couple of things here that we don't see before. One is two crossings, right? There's our north crossing and our north crossing and our south crossing and our south crossing. So English Gothic churches often have two crossings. That's different than French churches, which seldom do. And there's something missing here. Do you notice what that something is? If you look at this church, the something that is missing is all of those absidial chapels. And what work did those absidial chapels do? Those absidial chapels were places for relics. And the reason for this is that the cult of relics was sort of a French and to some extent German, and I guess to some extent Italian thing. But, God, but relics was not really a part of the English version of Catholicism. And maybe because there weren't martyred English saints in the same kind of ways, um, but th those, those architectural spaces don't exist. And they don't exist because there's no need for them. We have pointed arches. We have flying buttresses. And you'll see that we have stained glass windows. And so one of the things that the church was meant for was for a certain kind of progression around it. So, so the, the priests who lived here would ambulate around the interior and exterior and cloister of the church in a pattern kind of way. And this arrow sure, it speaks to that. Let's show you an insight of this. You can see some of the elements that we would traditionally see in other French Gothic churches. Although the rose window window has been replaced with large lancet windows. Lancet windows are those sort of pointed arches, those long pointed arch windows. So the rose windows are gone, but we still have pointed arches. We still have stained glass windows. We still have a Claire story. Looking at these two buildings, which were done about the same time, <coughs> sort of makes clear the, the, the regional differences in Gothic architecture between the kinds of things that we see in England and France. And a diagram makes that really plain too, right? Chapels for relics. No chapels, two crossings, only one. Still Latin cross planned. The other thing is this little bit here. And again, if those X's are lines of vaulting, then in some parts of English uh, Gothic churches, the vaulting here looks like things have exploded. And that's a unique development of English Gothic architecture that we call fan vaulting. And it is pretty fantastic. When you go to London, and you should, one of the buildings that you have the opportunity to go visit is this, is Westminster Abbey. Um, this is the Royal Cathedral, I guess. It's, well, it's not a cathedral. The Royal Church um, in, in, um, in London. Um, this is it while it was grimy and dirty, and this is its freshly clean state when I was there in, oh golly, let me get the date right, 2009, I think. Um, when you go here, you can do the audio tour. And it's voiced by Jeremy Irons, and that's certainly worth your four quid, so you should do that. But you can see that this has kind of a, a nice French front to it, right? Big, towering um, north and east towers. And this is not just a church, but all kinds, but an entire architectural complex, including a sanctuary here and a, a large chapel on the back end, which I'll show to you. On, in just a second. Pointed arches, Claire Story windows, English Gothic often has distinct elements and this plan here sort of makes clear the kind of vaulting that is present in this church. In this diagram, there's no vaulting. In this one, you can absolutely see it. And in French churches, those, those bays, those individual squares kind of look like X's. And here you have it here. But when we get in the nave and certainly into the sanctuary and chapels, that vaulting completely explodes. And this is what that looks like.
Gothic, we can think of Gothic as being like a mother language, right? And within that mother language, there can be a variety of different dialects within it. French spoken in France is different than French spoken in Canada, which is certainly, goodness knows, different than French spoken in Louisiana. And so the architectural language is roughly the same, but there are regional dialects that are different in this kind of vaulting and this from the, the, the choir of Gloucester um, is very much a part of that. Wow. This is a riot for the eyes. It does not exist pretty much anywhere but England. I mean, this is the, the chapel of Henry VII and it's kind of out of control. Now, one of the things that's, I don't know, interesting about me, I guess it's not that interesting about me. I think it's kind of cool, but but I grew up in England um, and I didn't bring in a map of England, but I, I about an hour, maybe 75 minutes north, slightly northwest of London is is the university town of Oxford. And um, my dad was a student there. Um, and, and we lived just about three miles outside Oxford in a little place called Banbury. And Oxford, as Oxford University, is filled with a variety of colleges. And all those colleges are distinct. So what you're looking at here is the stairwell that leads to the dining hall of Christ College of Oxford University. And so this dates from around 1500. Um, there is likewise a, a chapel attached to all of this. So one of the things that's kind of important to know is that Oxford University, all those colleges are separate. So my dad was a student at Maudlin College, not at Christ College, but I think this is kind of a cool one because I bet you've seen it before, even if you don't think that you've seen it before. Take a look. Take a gander, and at the beginning of the first Harry Potter movie, those group of wide-eyed kids all come up a stairwell ah, to speak to McGonagall, who's going to have them go to the, see the sorting hat. And this is where they filmed that. I just think that's kind of cool. So, so this is the dining hall of Christ College, and it is in many ways, the basis for the dining hall at Hogwarts. And so, so English Gothic getting all kinds of mad love. Here's the chapel of Christ College. Um, and I just think that is fantastic. So, and, and I fish eyed this a little bit. So this isn't quite as bendy as you would think it is here, but there certainly is some heft to it. And so all of that is fantastic, good stuff. All right, so London, Oxford is maybe about where the L is in Banbury is, you know, at the top of the L. So very, very close. All right, my friends, we did some English uh, Gothic. Let's do some Gothic stuff. And and we've already looked at this building before when we talked about the Garrow Cross. And it's my hope that you remember the Garrow Cross. I don't know how you could forget the poor thing. Um, the Garrow Cross was made in 980. It was an Ottonian work. And it looked a little something like this. And this was in the cathedral at Cologne. And Cologne, if you're looking for it on a map, it might often be spelled K-O-L-N, which is the German spelling for it. It is in what was once West Germany and now just Germany proper. It's along the Rhine River. Um, there are something like 87 breweries in Cologne if you're ever looking for a place to have a Kolsch. A Kolsch is a kind of German beer. But don't do that. You're 18. Don't drink. This, my friends, is the cathedral there. It was begun in 1248. It was, it was finished in 1880. And I wasn't a math major, but let me see if I could do it. 632 years. Can you imagine the changes the world went to in 632 years? I mean, honestly, can you, can you grapple with the, the, the magnitude of all of that? You probably think I'm, it's a typo of some sort. It's not 632 years. And one of the things that's fascinating about this church, um, first of all, look at this. I mean, just look at the size of it. Um, when you visit this, when you go to Cologne in person um, and you arrive on the train station and you work around, walk around here, you'll notice something. 
and that is the every building around it is brand new. Every building in Cologne, it seems, is made after 1948 because Cologne was a major target of the American Army Air Corps for bombing during World War II. And one of the fun facts, it kind of makes me feel good when I think about it. One of the fun facts is that, that there were art historians working with the Army Air Corps telling them, bomb that, bomb that, don't bomb that. It's a, it's a 800 year old church. Now, to be honest, the inside as it looks now looks great. The inside as it looked like in 1945, not so great because this thing was hit by 12 allied bombs during World War II. But if I were in class right now, if we were in a room together and I could do a, a, an impression, I could do my impression of the cathedral at Cologne being hit by bombs. And let's be honest, I would blink a little bit and push the dirt off my shoulder and go on with my day. Because all things considered, the only thing that happened is some vaulting fell. The church is still there. What happens when you build something to last? It lasts. No cheap plywood in the Cathedral of Cologne. Um, this thing is absolutely fabulous. Again, the Gero Cross is in one of the arms of the church. And originally, in the front part of the, of the, um, of the altar, was this shrine of the three magi. It's made of gold, silver, bronze, gems, all kinds of crazy stuff. And it was, there were relics of the three wise men placed inside this. Um, and the Holy Roman Emperor, Frederick Barbosa, who was a direct descendant in terms of political power of Charlemagne, gave these relics to the Archbishop of Cologne in 1164. And this reliquary, and this thing is probably like eight feet long, rests in the chapel of this church. And so it's a good example of the ways in which Gothic architecture looks. This thing is bigger than a football field. It's enormous, enormous. We did Cologne. Let's do some stuff up here. And I want to talk a little bit about Italian Gothic architecture. And Vasari, the art historian who I, who I mentioned last time, uh, he would like you to think that there is no such thing as Italian Gothic architecture, but of course there is. But of course, it looks different. And, and it exists in a couple of really cool and interesting places that we'll look at. One, we'll look at Siena. And Siena is this gem of a town that you should visit at least for a day when you go to Italy. We, I was there in the summer of 2019, and we were there for a good, a good day. I wish we could have stayed longer, but it's lovely. Uh, so there's Gothic architecture to be found there. If you ever go to Pisa and it's worth an afternoon, you certainly know about the Leaning Tower. I went there in the summer of 2019. I've only been there twice, actually, but the tower still is leaning. But we also see some really fabulous architecture um, in places like Orvieto, which you see on a hilltop uh, on your way from Rome to Florence. And then we'll look at least a little bit um, of the cathedral in Florence, I think. So let's get started, my friend. And I give you two Italian Gothic structures. They date from about the same time. On the right-hand side, you see the Cathedral of Siena, and on the left-hand side, you see the Cathedral at Orvieto. And these buildings should look similar to you and distinct from the things we've looked at so far because they have developed a uniquely Italian Gothic vernacular. To begin with, you'll notice that the outside has colored stone in it. And this will be something that we do not see in French, English, or German Gothic architecture, but is very prevalent in Italian Gothic architecture. And if I played my cards correctly and I have the Cathedral of Florence open, you will see that with great, great clarity, the use of colored stone, certainly in Siena as well. Secondly, there are mosaics on the outside of these churches in a way that is almost unheard of in, 
in earlier French, English, and German Gothic structures. They use color in a brand new kind of way on the outside of churches. Sculpture is still prevalent. It's not as overwhelming. And the use of mosaics begins to creep in. So when you go to Siena, and you should, you absolutely need to go to what's called the Campo. And this is um, the, the courtyard in front of this building, the Palazzo Publico. It's a pretty cool space. They do a horse race out here two times a summer. And this is the, uh, the piazza in front of it. And then the tower of the Piazza Publico, which is a really, really fantastic um, architectural space. Here you can see it from the air. This dates from around 1300. 1300 Siena was one of the real sort of gems of Italy and it's kind of forgotten now. It's so it's comparatively devoid of tourists. This is that cathedral, both as it exists in our textbook pictures and as it looked on a kind of a dreary day in uh, January, actually New Year's Day in 2009. And you can see a little bit how colored stone is working out here. Um, I haven't gotten new pictures of this church um, into these PowerPoints from this summer, but but this is green, green travertine and then pink marble. So this use of colored stone provides an entirely different sense of aesthetic for these buildings. They just look different. And even on the side of the church, we have alternating light and dark stones. Most Italian Gothic structures are not big enough or have enough windows to require flying buttresses. And if we were to think about it, I, and I don't like to get inside people's heads and I'm not an armchair psychologist, but I'll play one today. I wonder if Vasari's beef with French Gothic architecture in particular was because he was jealous. Like those things are bigger, they're higher, they have more windows, they're more volume, voluminous. I mean, all of those things, um, they're just different than Italian Gothic architectures. When you walk into these churches, and I don't have good interior pictures, I apologize, they just seem darker and not nearly as bright compared to their French Gothic brothers. And part of that is littler windows, right? Little windows, not very high. I call your attention to the last Italian building we look at until we come back to the Renaissance. And this is the Florence Cathedral. Um, the baptistry of the cathedral is this right here. The Campanile is just off the scene here, but this gives you a good idea as to what Italian Gothic architecture looks like. This was begun in 1296 and finished in the 1450s when they finally got a dome over the top of it. You can't see the dome here but I will show it to you when we get to module three. My friends, we got one building left to look at and we're going back to France to look at Saint-Chapelle. What you're looking at here is a relatively bad and ugly picture of it, um, probably from the, the 1930s, but it does the kind of work I expected to do, which is to demonstrate the size of this. This was a small private Palatine Chapel for Louis IX. It was built in five years between 1243 and 1243. You probably remember Louis IX because he is the saint in Saint Louis, right? Saint Louis. He was a remarkably pious man. He was a crusader. And when he went on his holy crusades, he brought back relics that he had purchased in the Holy Land. He bought so many of them that he built this church to house them. Um, and the relics, he paid for every dollar he paid to construct the church. He paid $100 for the relics. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that nonsense? Can you imagine buying a house and then filling it with a hundred times the cost of the house with stuff? I mean, just for the sake of math, this is like being having a $100,000 home and then filling your $100,000 home with $10 million worth of stuff. Maybe you should have a $10 million home and $100,000 worth of stuff. But that's what he did. And, and 
uh, and these relics were of dubious authenticity, but Louis didn't care. He had them. And I'll tell you some of the relics he bought. He bought, and it sounds like I'm making this up, and sometimes I like, I get a little jokey, but this is serious. These are the relics Louis thought he bought. He bought a piece of the true cross. He bought one of the nails that, that nailed Christ to the true cross. He bought the crown of thorns. He bought the arrow that pierced Christ's side. He bought the sponge that was taken to Christ's mouth in order to deliver what Christ thought was water, but actually was vinegar. He bought one of Christ's, the word I always read in, a, in, a, in an article was nappies. So he bought one of Christ's diapers. He bought the, the, um, the, the veil of the Virgin Mary. Like, I'm serious. Those are the things that Louis thought he brought back to house in this church. And so I mentioned to you a little while ago that relics are often placed in reliquaries and reliquaries are often supremely decorated jewel-like boxes to house those relics. And so what, what Louis wanted to do was both to put these relics in reliquaries and then to put them in a chapel that was like a gigantic reliquary. Last module, last artifact, I beg your pardon, I mentioned to you the burning of Notre Dame. And one of the things I heard during the news coverage was that all of the religious artifacts of the church had been removed from safekeeping because they were doing some restoration work on the church. Those relics from Saint-Chapelle were in Notre Dame and you could see them every Good Friday. They kind of paraded them around and part and many of them were in the, the treasury. But those were made for this structure. And and as you can see, like this little spirally here and that there is the stairway up and the stairway down. And look, one, two, three, four, five bays long and then an apse. It's a little stairwell, a little stairwell. And this is the lower chapel. The stairwell is just off to your left over here. And this is like the gift shop, of course, because you need to have a gift shop. Um, and so it's filled with pointed arches as we expect. And the colors and symbols of the French monarchy, that deep navy blue, the burgundy, and then the gold fleur-de-lis, which becomes a symbol for the French monarchy and the Bourbon family very specifically. And so here is your obligatory gift shop photo from the bottom of Saint-Chapelle. Here is the stairwell up. It's small, it's made for short Frenchmen born in the 13th century and not for six foot one Americans. Um, uh, who are trying to climb up there. I mean, if I was, if I was uh, of the like Lord Tyrion from Game of Thrones, I'd been really comfortable. It is cramped and tight. And there is nothing in the lower part of this chapel that prepares you for what happens when you get to the upper chapel. And if we were in a real classroom, the thing I would do now is go to wherever the lights are and turn them off. And I teach in a room with no windows. So I'd close the door, turn off the windows, and then you would get a little bit of that. This, my friends, is Saint-Chapelle, made over five years in the middle part of the 13th century. This thing has the highest concentration of original windows and the greatest concentration of windows of any Gothic church in the world. This thing is a kaleidoscope of color. This thing is a jewel box. This is the place is this is a place where not most people go to. They go to Notre Dame. You have to go to Notre Dame. But they seldom go here, even though you can see both from the spires of one another. My first trip to Paris was in the summer of 2000. And, um, and I had an ex-girlfriend who was living in Paris and I was able to, um, to crash with her for, um, well, gosh, for six weeks. So thank you, of course, Emily. And one day, Emily took me here to meet her friend. Her friend was, her name was Vicky Marie and they were both, um, they were both from, um, from Florida. Like, and, 
and Vicky Marie gave tours here as part of, um, she was a PhD student at the Sorbonne writing a dissertation on medieval, medieval depictions of Mary Magdalene, I think. Um, but she gave tours here. And so I came back to Saint-Chapelle a whole bunch and would go to the ticket counter and I would say, bonjour, je m'appelle Brian, je voudrais voir Vicky Marie, s'il vous plaît, which literally was, hi, I'm Brian. I'd like to see Vicky Marie. And if Vicky Marie was on the second story, as she usually was, they would say, Dorian, uh, deuxième étage, merci. So go up, go upstairs and I would walk on in. Um, and so whenever I wanted to, I was able to come to Saint-Chapelle. And in doing so, this is what it looked like recently when they were doing restoration work. Um, and in doing so, I got to go up here a whole bunch. And Vicky Marie was able to take me, <laughs> I'll show you the door in a second, was able to take me up the stairwell. Remember I showed you this door? The stairwell up? There's another doorway here, but you can keep going up. And she took me all the way up to the top of this thing here. I mean, it's one of the real cool things I've ever done ever is he got me into the top of this church. And you can see this thing there, like there's these circles where those vaults come together. And so on the top of that space, we'll come back to the door in a second, on the top of that space here, there was a piece of wood and we were on the top of that church up on the ceiling up here. And she pointed at this piece of wood. She said, move the wood, move the wood, the wood away. And so I did. And I looked down and that's what I saw. I had a digital camera back then. It was an old school Sony Mavica. You've never even heard of this camera. Get this. This thing was a one quarter meta megapixel. Your iPhone is probably 12 or 14. So to put it in a different way, your camera shoots at a resolution 50 times what my camera did. And it saved photos on floppy disks. Your teacher is laughing right now because he or she remembers floppy disks. And you're just confused because you have no idea what a floppy disk is. It saved photo on floppy disks. And so I was on the top of this ceiling looking down at that hole. And she said, you know, the acoustics in this place are so fantastic that you can yell and the sound only bounces to the side of it. I was like, really? She said, yeah. Like, can I try? She said, sure. So I yelled. I screamed. Not a single person looked up. And I said, Hey, what if what would happen if I dropped a coin? She's like, well, nothing. The coin would just fall. And so, so I reached in my pocket, and France was still on the franc back then. And if memory serves me correctly, I think it was about seven francs to the dollar. So French had centimes; they were pennies, you know, pennies and nickels and dimes and things like that. So I reached into my pocket and and was looking down these holes like a World War II bombardier looking down a sight of a bomber and drop some change and didn't hit anybody. I was going for that guy's head. Um, and nobody noticed anything until one guy kind of looked and saw a coin bouncing and he looked up at the ceiling. And of course he can't see me. I'm an eyeball looking through all of this, but I'm certain that he was convinced of that light was raining from heaven. And I thought that was kind of cool. This is the view of Notre Dame from the spire of Saint-Chapelle. And when I was there, I found a nail and I was convinced that's Emily's hand, not mine. I was convinced that this might have been one of the nails of the true cross. One of the things that um, that Vicky Marie allowed me to do was to go up on some scaffolding and take pictures of the stained glass. And so it was a different scaffolding than what they had up here. This this was the scaffolding from 2013 there. This was different. It was up in the in the, the apps end of it. And we were literally just up on a wooden platform. And so so I have some pictures of those stained glass taken a long, long time ago with a digital camera that is certainly archaic by our standards today. But I thought this was the coolest thing ever. The richness of all of this. And I don't get ooey gooey in front of art real often, but to look at these windows, I thought was a really special thing. 
Stained glass changes as the day goes on. And depending upon how the sun hits the stained glass window, you might have bursts of color that both show up on the floor and move around the floor. And all of that is pretty fantastic. So let me tell you a Vicki Marie story. And this is Vicki Marie uh, when I was uh, back in Paris in 2013. So I hadn't seen her in 14 years. Um, but we went up for a couple of drinks and we went actually went back to the, the, the church. Um, one of the days I went to go visit Vicky Marie and I went literally just to go stop in and see the church. You had to pay to get into the church. Um, I think now it's like eight euro um, and it's worth every penny of your eight euro. Eight euro now is about nine bucks, maybe nine and a quarter. Um, but if I could get in for free, I was a starving graduate student. So I wanted to get in for free. So one day I pop in and and I say to Vicky Marie, like, let's just walk around. She's like, okay. So she's walking around and talking about the church. And again, I'm, I'm not a scholar of French Gothic architecture. I teach survey of Western art one. Um, I teach art appreciation and I've taught a class on medieval art, but those are not specific classes on French Gothic architecture. I mean, my professor at Maryland had a PhD in French Gothic architecture. I'm not that guy. I write on American uh, American portraiture. So, so she knew a lot more than me. So we're walking around and she's talking about stuff. And she says, well, hold on a second. People are getting a little noisy. I need to go shh them. I was like, okay. And I didn't know exactly what she meant, but she, she sort of disappears for a second. Um, and I showed you a door a little while ago. Here it is. That door is over here. She dodges into that door. And she says, shh, silence, silence dans la chapelle, s'il vous plaît. Now, I honestly don't know if you could hear what I just whispered into my microphone, but she said, silence, silence in my chapel or silence in the chapel, please. And so people hushed. And that was that. So we did some more stuff. We walked around. And she's like, and you know, a half hour later, people were noisy and rambunctious again. And she said, hold on, I need to go shh them. And I said, hey, 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 can I shh them? She said, do you think you're qualified to shh them? And I was like, Vicky Marie, come on now. I've been a DJ at a roller skating rink for four years. I got to tell you, I've got mad shh game. And she says, okay, come on back. So once again, Vicky Marie took me to the red door and in there hysterically is a Coke vending machine. I'm not making that up. So we go in there and she gives me the microphone and quite suddenly, quite suddenly I'm scared. Little, a little surprised by this, but I'm scared. And I give them the longest shh they've ever heard. I mean, I take a deep breath and I shh it out. I'm like, shh. And let me tell you, it worked. They were all quiet. My sh had worked. And so I give the microphone back to her and she says, you have to finish. And all of a sudden I now know that she wants me to speak French. And as you know, my French, not très bien. And I was like, no. And I try to give her back the microphone. She says, finish. I was like, no. She says, finish. And so I grab the mic and I'm terrified. And I say, silence, silence dans mon chapelle, s'il vous plaît. And I'm not done with the word before I realize what I've said. I haven't said silence in the chapel. I say silence in my chapel. As if I'm God and I peek my head out this door. And I got to tell you, everyone was looking there. So one of my real, good, one of my real professional achievements in life um, is having uh, people at Saint Chapelle. One more story about this building, and I'm going to wrap things up. But this is a good story. It's one of my favorite stories to tell. So one day, Vicky Marie and I were going to get, we're going to get lunch. So we'd gone to the church, and I usually had a deal. Um, you let me hang out in the church for free, I'll buy you lunch or a cup of coffee. And so so we're at a, at a cafe not far from Notre Dame. Um, and she says, hey, have you ever seen a movie uh, called National Geographic's European Vacation? Vacation. I was like, have I ever seen it? Of course I've seen it. I love that movie. I loved that movie when I was a kid. That movie had the rusty girl in it. And she's like, what's the rusty girl? I was like, well, there's a scene 
in National Lampoon's European Vacation, where Chevy Chase and his family go to Paris. And the, when they get to Paris, he gives them all berets. And so I'll go and tell you the story. So, so he gives them all berets. And on the berets, their names have been embroidered in them. And it's, it's Chevy Chase and his wife and then their two kids. And the two kids are teenagers. And t- teenagers never think what their parents think is cool is actually cool. And so they're wearing these berets around Paris. And Russ, the son, doesn't want to. But the dad makes him. And so they go up to the Eiffel Tower and they're wearing these berets. And they're silly berets, right? His name is Clark. Her name is like Ella or something. And Rusty is down there and he looks down the corridor and he sees this beautiful girl. I have no idea what her name was. I just called her the Rusty Girl because she looks down and smiles at him. And Rusty looks down at her and smiles at her. He winks at her. She blows him a kiss back. He blows her a kiss back. The dog barks. And then the Rusty girl does it. She looks at him and says, Rusty. And then he realizes that she's making fun of him because he not only has a beret, but he has a beret with his name stitched on it. And so the father comes back and he says, what's wrong, Russ? And Russ like, I hate that you're making me wear this stupid hat. And so the dad says, well, look, if the hat offends you, it offends me. And if it bothers you, it bothers me. And so Clark takes the beret off Rusty He throws it over the side of the Eiffel Tower, and then the dog goes after it. So I told that story to Vicky Marie. And the whole time I'm telling her this story, let's go to, let's go back to the rusty girl. The whole time I'm telling her this story, she's just smiling. And I was like, all right, I got to know, why are you smiling? And she's like, I work with her. I was like, shut your mouth. You don't work with her. She's like, I totally work with her. And, oh, my gosh, I can't remember her name now. It'll come back to me. I was like, well, I have to meet her. That's all there is to it. She's like, do you want to? I'm like, of course I want to. Like, she was all I needed when I was 11. She was blonde. She was French. Um, Like, she was perfect. And she said, husky, it's all I needed in life. So the day before I left Paris, I went to Notre Dame. (laughs) This is my 24-year-old self. Is that right? 24-year-old self. Um, with the rusty girl. And to be honest, she might have peaked a little young, (laughs) but she couldn't have been more charming. She was eight months pregnant. She was lovely. She was not an actress, actually. She was a ballerina who was in one movie. This was it. But she took a photograph with me, and I thought that was absolutely lovely. She was just great. Um, And when I look at this picture now, Let me bring it home to to module one. I think of this picture now with the the simple idea of who loves who more, (laughs) right? Like here I am, this 24-year-old, super happy to meet her kind of guy. She's like a stupid white American who doesn't know anything, but I'll take his picture. And she was absolutely fabulous. So, all right, my friends. When we teach survey of Western art or Western survey of art, we usually break it into two components prehistoric to Gothic and Renaissance to modern. And so this class, which looks at bits and pieces of both, I've broken into two big parts, module one and module two, which the first module was prehistoric to classical. And the second one was, uh, or prehistoric to Egypt and then classical to, to, um, to Gothic. We have wrapped that up now. Your second quiz is coming. Do, 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 do. The next module will primarily involve the art of the Renaissance and of the Baroque. So get ready. Module three coming up.